God has cursed the city and there must be reasons. Or perhaps it is the many sins made by our fathers and grandfathers. Or the eternal spirit of opposition for our fellow citizens is the cause of this wrath. So wrote one of the most famous inhabitants of the city. A city which is said that not even a crow will land there. Bulgarians already know. It is about Vratza, but the history is vastly more interesting and a little bit longer. Vratza, where the crow will not land. It is a phrase that does not invoke happiness amongst the locals, but it is repeated to them by everybody. Where does it come from? Near Vratza Gorge and the cave Ledenica. Above the city are towering pinnacles of cliffs. The weather can change in minutes, from sunny to stormy and back. This is the kingdom of eagles. Here, the crows simply dare not to land. Vratza is 110 kilometers from the capital of Bulgaria, Sofia, and 72 kilometers from the ferry port on the Danube of the Romanian town Beckett. We will mention the Danube town again. However, this story tells of a saint, a revolutionary, a manufacturer, and an artist. They lived at different times, in different epochs. Their total existence spans within 220 years, from 1739 to 1959, a long while. They remarkably affected the history of the city, and made it what it is today. But each of them has changed the destiny of Bulgaria. They have also had an impact in various parts of Europe. Clergyman and writer Sofourny of Vratza, poet and revolutionary Christo Botev, Mito Orozov, the manufacturer, sculptor Andrei Nikolov. A cursed city, wrote Vasil Konchov, scientist and politician, the closest friend of the Orozov factory owner. The history of Vratza, however, began unthinkably earlier, and it is fundamental to the whole continent. 4,000 years before Christ, archaeologists found tools from that era, which are definite proof of the existence of a settlement from that time. It was there more than 1,000 years before the founding of ancient Egypt. 4,000 years before Christ, these lands were the center of organized economic upturn. It is the Chalcolithic era. Pottery and copper mining were flourishing crafts. Near Vratza have been made some of the most important archaeological discoveries in all of Europe. Two of them are related to the most advanced civilization of the mysterious continent, the Thracians. They influenced each other and vied with the ancient Greeks. Some of the Greek commanders have said that they would have submitted to them if the various tribes were united. The Regional Historical Museum preserves two of their most remarkable treasures, Mogilanska and Rogozensko. Mogilanska is a part of a burial mound with three tombs. One was robbed in antiquity, but the other two are almost completely preserved. In the largest of the tombs, archaeologists found the remains of an old man and a young woman. 
They also found weapons, silver files, and other containers. The funeral practice for this tomb was extremely rich, and this showed scientists that there was buried the princess of the Thracian tribe Tribali, who lived in the 4th century BCE. The head of the young woman was adorned with a golden crown of fine gold. Thracian funeral rituals are chilling from today's perspective. When someone dies, it turned into debates about his wives. His friends struggled to find which was his favorite. The one vested with such honor was solemnly and critically taken by men and women to the tomb, where they sacrificed the favorite wife, usually by the hand of the woman's closest relative, and then they buried her with her husband. So it was described by the father of modern history, Herodotus. The Rogozensko treasure is the largest Thracian treasure of Bulgaria, by the finding of which the country introduced Thracian studies as a part of world science. It was discovered by accident. In 1985, when digging in his garden, Ivan Dimitrov from the village of Rogozin located 65 exquisitely crafted silver vessels. Obviously, for some reason, they had to be hastily buried. In the beginning and the following year, archaeologists from the Museum of History in Vratsa found very near to Ivan's find the rest of the treasure. The final number was 165 vessels, bowls, pots, and files. It is assumed that they belonged to a local dynasty and were collected for almost a century and a half. They depict scenes from Thracian and ancient Greek mythology, which often overlap each other. This explains why the stories of heroes from these lands were not isolated exceptions. Of world sensation, however, was a woman. At excavations at the prehistoric settlement at the nearby village of Ahodin, a student came across a perfectly preserved female skeleton in a fetal position. Studies show that it is 8,100 years old. This was the oldest complete skeleton in Europe until the year 2004. The skeleton belonged to a woman aged 25 to 30, of a Mediterranean anthropological type. The scale of the discovery, however, is much larger. The burial was performed so long ago in a special way. The building surrounding her is a mausoleum. The find is unprecedented so far in the world. A mausoleum from the early Neolithic age. Millions of years earlier was built another unprecedented structure, but that one was of God's design. And so, the new old structure was called God's Bridge. It is located about 15 kilometers from Vratza. Yet how old is Vratza itself? Inside the town, Vratzian archaeologists managed to identify four historical layers, from antiquity to the Middle Ages. Their conclusion, Vratza is 25 centuries old. In the earth here have been found coins and artifacts from the 2nd and 1st centuries BCE, and a bronze seal made of coins from the time of Augustus. This completely changes the scientific assertion of a number of years ago that Vratza was just a settlement founded by the Slavs in the 6th century CE. Undoubtedly, during the majority of its existence, its name has been a variation of a Slavic word. Vratsata is the name of the gorge of Leva River. In the Roman and Byzantine eras, the city was called Valve, double doors in Latin. This is a rough translation of the Slavic word vratica, door, or more exactly, diminutive door. During the Middle Ages, it was called again vratica. Today, it is simple. 
Fratza. And this is the informal capital of the whole of northwestern Bulgaria. The city was a part of different countries, the Roman Empire, Byzantium, the Second Bulgarian Kingdom, the Ottoman Empire, and five years later, again as a part of Bulgaria. The Ottoman period was a grim time, not only for Vrata, but for all Bulgarians, and not only because of the long period of oppression lasting five centuries. At the fall of the Second Bulgarian State, they were confronted with a totally different culture and religion of the conquerors. Voluntary assimilation would have brought them comfort and relative stability, but they chose otherwise. They managed to preserve, for hundreds of years, their faith and national identity, but it brought them difficulties and despair every day. At the second half of the 18th century, it had been almost 400 years since the powerful Bulgarian state fell under the rule of the Ottoman Empire. The Bulgarian people still existed, but not their country. There was almost no historical memory of the state amongst the Bulgarian people. Only a token of family dignity was allowed by Ottoman rule to some wealthy Bulgarians who integrated into Islamic society. They were allowed to build residential towers. This is a version of the main or only tower in the medieval castle, the dungeon. It was designed to last in a defensive attack. These are two of the three preserved in Bulgaria. Dungeon Towers, Kurtpashova and Meschite. They were raised in the 17th and 18th centuries. But one monk decided that the ancient Bulgarian history still exists and was kept in different Bulgarian monasteries and spread throughout Europe's libraries. The spiritual name is Paisi Hilindarsky, just as the name of the monastery in which he served. He wrote the book Slavic History, based on the sources he gathered. Ironically, or coincidentally, the work appeared three years after the publication of one of the most significant books of European civilization, Candide, by the writer and philosopher of the French Enlightenment, Francois Voltaire. This novel, filled with bizarre events and ironic comments, parodies adventure novels and major tragedies. Today, many take it for the beginning of the style of novels of black humor. It begins with the visit of the protagonist to the Kingdom of Bulgarians, for whom this was a shocking experience because of their harsh laws. Paisi Hilindarsky wrote a similar book, with his own thoughts and different storylines. But its purpose, rather than parody, was to fuel and raise the lost Bulgarian national spirit. In the year 1794, the Bulgarian church had some religious freedoms, albeit with a number of limitations. For a bishop of the Vratsa diocese was appointed a Kotel priest Stoiko Vladislavov, under the name Sofrani of Vratsa. He was the first to assess and make a copy of the Book of Pisces, by whom he was impressed as a person. It was a significant work in the pre-Gutenberg era Bulgaria. In Vratsa, Sofrani engaged in activities unthinkable at the time. Nowhere in Bulgaria did the priesthood preach in Bulgarian, but they learned Greek psalms, which are unclear even for the priests. Greek is to Bulgarian Orthodoxy as is Latin to Catholicism, a completely unfamiliar language for the majority of believers. Sofrani began to preach to them in conversational Bulgarian. And not only this, he recounted scenes from the Bible which were accessible and even fun. He acquired great popularity among Bulgarians. This was not undeserved or the result of a cheap apostolic show. As a follower of Pisces, Sofrani had undertaken to assess the situation of the people in the historiographical scale, and the people counted on the fact that liberation would come from Russia. 
This liberation came with the next war with the Ottoman Empire. The Russian command contacted Sofrani. It relied on his increased influence amongst the whole of the Bulgarian people in order to provide free supplies to Russian troops detained by the harsh winter of the Romanian countryside. At the same time, the bishop negotiated various thorny issues with the Greek church. To the Russians and Romanians, Sofrani of Vratza became something like a prime minister of the Bulgarian government in exile. When in the Romanian capital of Bucharest, he wrote his books, Sunday Book, and The Life and Sufferings of the Sinful Sofrani, amongst others. The Life became the first modern Bulgarian autobiography. It was written in the style of the eclectic Slavic history, but became extremely popular. In the coming decades, it would be increasingly in demand and would become the first Bulgarian bestseller. Concerning Sofrani, there is a nearly forgotten legend, but recently it has been building in popularity amongst the local people. Sixteen kilometers from Vratza is the cave Ledenica. It is an unusual cave, to say the least. The temperature inside is permanent and stable between 8 and 16 degrees Celsius throughout the year. It is 320 meters long and has 10 rooms. It was discovered in the Middle Ages by goat herds who found a perfect year-round refrigerator in which to store their milk. But there was no way for them to know that this is one of the caves with the most technologically perfect acoustics in the world. Natural Acoustics Technology Today, Ladanika has hosted elitist symphony concerts. Although bishop, the days of the Vrata Diocese of Sofrani were severe. It was under constant raids of robbers, detachments called Kurgilis. Ottoman authorities turned a blind eye to their lawless bloody attacks on civilians. They even kidnapped Christians for ransom. Sofrani knew that if he were to get into their hands, the ransom for him would be unbearable because he was bishop. Then he would have been publicly slain, as no one could possibly cover a ransom for him. At the same time, he did not want to abandon his flock without spiritual consolation. Down in Ledenica Cave, he discovered the magic of the cave rooms. He began to lead his sermons there, underground, where the laity was exalted by his words. They would pass through the little and big gaps to listen to his sermons in the rock halls, now called the Passage of Sinners, the Lake of Desires, and sometimes went to the highest point of the cave, the seventh heaven. These rooms are not accidentally named this way. Sophronie of Rata died in 1813. A century and a half later, the Orthodox Church proclaimed Sofrani a saint, Bulgarian in 1964 and Russian in 1965. 35 years after his death, approximately 150 kilometers from the town of Vratza in Kalofer, Christo Botov Petkov was born. He lived only 28 years, but his biography is amazing. Amongst the Vratza rocks takes place one of the most sorrowful and desperate events in Bulgarian history. Here begins an eternal legend. Christo Botev was in exile, but was inspired by the news of the National April Uprising in 1876 against the Ottoman rule. Already known as a poet and publicist, an active revolutionary and activist abroad, he organized a revolutionary band. Together with its fighters dressed as farmers in the Romanian city of Gyurgovo, he boarded the Austro-Hungarian passenger ship Radetsky. On his way to join other rebels in the ports of Zimnica, Turnu Magurele and Beckett, Botev had already been informed by message that the uprising was crushed and the march would be meaningless. 
but he seized the ship. Ship Radetsky was built in 1851 and served the route between the ports of Galati and Orsova on the Danube. She was named after the Austrian Field Marshal of Czech Oregon, Joseph Radetsky. Composer Joseph Strauss's father dedicated to him the march Radetsky. Of course, it was not necessary for Botov to seize a full passenger ship to move his band to the opposite coast of Romania. But he desperately hoped that Europe will hear about the liberation struggle of the Bulgarians. He was also a journalist. He officially handed to the Master Anglender a letter which states, We ask the gentlemen passengers not to worry and remain calm. As for you, Mr. Captain, I have a hard job to invite you to leave the steamer at my disposal until our very descent. At the same time, I declare that your smallest resistance will put me in sad need to use force. And in one and in the other case, our voice to fight is this. Bulgaria lives. To live Franz Josef, Count Andrasi to live, to live a Christian Europe. When the young men went down Kozuladui for their suicide march, they knelt and kissed their native land. Passengers of the Radetsky waved hats and wished them success. The ship departed again under the command of the captain with three solemn sirens. The 200 resolved to have all of the men try to go to the mountains in the depths of the Ottoman Empire. They were 80 kilometers away from Vratza. They went through 10 villages, but, contrary to their expectations, few Bulgarians joined them to fight for their freedom. Botev was forced to flee with his band, to fight a retreat against the numerically superior Turkish army, which was already on his heels. Europe knew about his desperate act, but the Ottoman Empire did not waste a minute. In numerous battles were killed many of his comrades. The leader was hopeless. Two weeks after stepping on home soil, the last battle of Botev took place. On the 1st of June, a bullet pierced the commander. The obviously suicidal endeavor could be explained with the youthful and idealistic spirit of Botev. A year earlier, he wrote, The idea of freedom is omnipotent, and the love for it can achieve everything. He left one fiery phrase, which reached other continents and other uprisings for freedom. He who falls in battle for freedom never dies. Although he was not born in Vratza, Christo Botev is the most symbolic figure here. The central square is named after him. A 12-meter statue was raised in his honor that seems ready to fight the very mountains themselves. On this square, the Turks exposed the cut-off heads of the killed rebels in order to terrify the population. But another magical legend in this region and throughout Bulgaria started just here. Locals tell that from all of the killed men was missing only one head, that of the commander, Botev. Until the 70s of the 20th century, many adults ideally believed that he hid somewhere and continued to avenge his comrades against his enemies. A simple calculation would show that such an age is hard to achieve by even the most stubborn revolutionary, and the Ottoman Empire had been long gone. Eleven years after Hristo Botev, in 1859, Mito Orozov was born in Vratsa. At the early age of 14 to 15 years old, he began to learn different crafts, blacksmithing, repairing old stoves, and guns. He became a courier of the secret revolutionary organization in the city. When he was 19 years old, his homeland was liberated. Maybe if he would have been five or 10 years older, he would have been one of those who died with Botev. But at a very young age, he found himself in a very different situation. Bulgaria was going through modernization, 
and entrepreneurship became a more remarkable quality than patriotism and sacrifice. It was as if the young Orozov was created exactly for this. Although self-taught, at 24 years old, he already had his own workshop. He owned and managed the production of trucks and horse-drawn carts with iron fittings on the wheels. He was part of the global wave of transport, along with rail transport, the modernizing trains and metros first. He acquired his own factory for convertibles, cabs, and clunkers. These cars were characterized by grace, but also strength. The pride of the manufacturer were the springs. They went through the furnace constructed by him. Hoods provided warmth and comfort for the passengers. Soon, the word spread throughout Bulgaria of the modern vehicles coming from Vratsa. At the end of the 19th century, even the court of the Bulgarian Tsar Ferdinand began to order vehicles from the factory Orozov. The manufacturer was consumed by the thought of improvement, but not for profit at any cost. In 1907, he became the first employer in Bulgaria who introduced a nine-hour working day as opposed to the usual 12 hours at that time. The same year, the factory of Orozov won gold and silver medals in various categories at a London exhibition. Then he was contacted by the American manufacturer, Henry Ford. He offered Orozov a partnership with the Detroit-based factory Ford Motors Company, founded only four years before, and the cart factory, M. Orozov. The Bulgarian refused. At this point, the U.S. city began its rise as a global automotive capital. Perhaps that was one of Orozov's mistakes. Only a few years later, Bulgaria would sink into the maelstrom of World War I and two Balkan Wars. This affected almost fatally the business of Mito Orozov. There was a drastic decline for the demand of luxury coaches. In the early 20s, he began to rise from the blows his business had suffered and continued to suffer. And then, a large urban fire spread over the factory. Orozov was inside. At the sight of the flames which were fiercely swallowing the fruits of his labor and talent, he decided to stay inside with his favorite burning car models. Thus, he remained true to his belief that a man must die healthy, on their own two feet and in the workplace, not sick and in bed. While in 1903, Mito Orozov was at the peak of his world fame, in Paris, a 25-year-old student of sculpture from Vratza was yet to begin his rise. Andrei Nikolov, however, had the opportunity to show his art and receive favorable comments from names such as Auguste Rodin and to live a bohemian lifestyle. Later, he spent his life between Paris, Sofia, Rome, and Fratza. The Western press called him the poet of marble and bronze. He created remarkable works throughout Italy and Bulgaria. He, like his fellow citizen Orozov, was sought after by the royal court in Sofia for different unique projects. Although he was famous in Italy, Nikolov preferred to spend his old age and die in his homeland. The year is 1959, just 220 years after the birth of the first of this unusual Vratza IV, Solferini. Sofroni passed away in mystery. Nobody knows anything about his last years. Botev and Orozov died tragically. Nikolov, at the age of 81, at peace with himself, but lonely. Sofroni of Vratza, Christo Botev, Mito Orozov, Andrei Nikolov. If the four had met somewhere in the time and space continuum, Maybe none of them would like the other three, but these great men, just like a human compass, represent four opposite sides of our progress. Two of them were born in Vratza, the others not. 
but for all of them, their mission was linked inexorably with Vratza. So if you have roots in Vratza, you have to reach the end. The journey is thus, Vratza, perseverance till the end and beyond.